Good day and welcome to Westpac's Live Experts Angle webinar, A Brave New World for Investors. My name is Rob Lockhart from Westpac's Davis Institute and with me today we are very lucky to have Tim Rocks, Head of Market Research and Strategy at BT Investment Solutions. Welcome Tim. Thank you Rob. So in this live webinar, Tim's going to explore some important technological advances that have the potential to change our lives and outline some of the market implications for investors. So let me tell you a little bit more about Tim. Tim has over 24 years of Australian and global investment experience. He has a deep understanding of the implications of macroeconomic developments and a proven track record identifying key market themes and drivers when forecasting risk and return scenarios. Prior to joining BT in July of 2015, Tim has been Head of Australian Investment Strategy at CBA, Namura Australia and Bank of America Merrill Lynch. He's also been the Head of Asian and Australian Investment Strategy at Macquarie both in Hong Kong and Australia. And before that was an economist with the Reserve Bank of Australia. Tim holds a Master's in Finance degree from the London Business School and also graduated with first class honours completing his Bachelor of Economics at Sydney University. So let's get into the good stuff and I'm going to hand over to Tim. Great. Thank you very much, Rob, and thanks all for, for dialing in. The topic today is a brave new world. And what we're aiming to do is talk about some of the major disruptive technology innovations that are, are affecting both our lives and markets at the moment. And the whole idea is I think the internet age is sparking a new wave of innovation in technology. We got our first sort of sample of that in the 1990s. But in recent years, assisted by government initiatives and incentives, it does seem to be a re-acceleration of that innovation and, and the potential impact on our lives. So the, in that first chart, just to give you sort of an idea of the way in which innovation is accelerating, the first part of that slide shows how quickly new technologies have been adopted over time and how quickly that's changing. So it shows that it took 38 years for radio to move from no users to 50 million users. Uh, so quite a long period of time. But new technologies since then have been ad ad uh, adopted much more rapidly. TV, it took 13 years to get to that 50 million user figure. Uh, iPod, uh, four years. Internet, three years. Facebook, one year. And Twitter, less than a year. So there's a really sort of rapid sort of take up now of new technology technologies, but also there's a rapid increase in the rate of technological breakthrough, as evidenced by the fact that it took 115 years for us to move from the first phone call uh, to the first website, but then only 16 years for us to move to the first iPhone, so for the, for the adoption of smartphone technology. So there are certainly a range of these uh, technologies. I've listed some on that first page, the Internet of Things which is all about connectivity to the internet. There's likely to be one trillion objects connected, everything from cars to fridges to um, basically everything in our homes. Automation of robots, big data, uh, biotech. But the one I, th I thought I would focus on today, given the, the limited time available, uh, is clean technology. Uh, and that's because I think this has the greatest potential to affect our lives really in the short term and the impact on markets and our lives is going to be profound. Uh, so yes, so clean tech boom. Now the argument here is that uh, there have been rapid and complementary advances in battery, solar and electric vehicle technologies that are really combining to, together to create one of the, I think it's one of the most significant transformations um, in economic history. And importantly, this is all happening much faster than you think and is really imminent. And we could be in a situation uh, in 10 to 15 years time where almost all of our pet, uh, vehicles are electric, almost all of our uh, energy is coming from solar, 
and a large majority of households are off the electrical grid. Um, so let me sort of take you through through these arguments. For those who want more information on this, I'm drawing heavily uh, on a book by a US academic called Tony Sieber uh, called Clean Disruption, and I would strongly sort of recommend that book to you. Um, but my starting point is that uh, tech take up is always underestimated. And to make this point, I brought in Gordon Gecko here. And to, to give an example, when the mobile phone was first uh, around in the early 80s, AT&T, which was the largest US tel telco, uh, engaged a number of industry experts to forecast what, tech tel uh, what mobile phone adoption would be by, 20, uh, by the year 2000, so with a 15 year time frame. The, the brave answer they came up with, looking at all those exports, was 900,000 subscribers. Of course, the end result was 109 million. So they're out by a factor of 120. And you know, the point here is that we tend to underestimate these when you, when you get these exponential sort of take up curves, <coughs> as mobile phones were, and as I think that um, electric vehicles are as well. So the chart in this slide shows uh, the the take up of electric vehicles. Uh, globally over the past five years. Now that's currently growing at about a 60% sort of growth rate. Uh, so really sort of quite remarkable. Uh, and uh, you know a lot of this as this chart showed has been driven by China. So it's actually happening sort of outside our sort of sphere of, uh, of looking. And about a third of the world's, world's electric vehicles uh, were sold in China last year. And China has very, very aggressive uh, plans. China is of the view that their pollution problem in the cities is overwhelmingly driven by particle pollution from car exhaust. So electrical, electric vehicles for them are both a solution to their pollution problem as well as an opportunity, an opportunity to be an early uh, innovator in what is likely to be a, a massive sort of global industry um, over the next sort of 15 years. But anyway, the important point is that is an exponential curve. Uh, look, that looks very, very much like those uh, those mobile phone um, sort of curves. And of course, what happens when you extrapolate this current rate of growth is you get some pretty interesting findings. So if that 60% growth uh, continues for another 15 years, uh, you'll basically be in a situation where all cars will be electric. Um, and there's very strong reasons to think that that will at least happen for the next few years. Number one, driven by China, where it's likely that there'll be very rapid growth. And number two, driven by Tesla. So we saw the response to their new car launch in April, where they had 400,000 orders for a car that doesn't currently exist. They haven't given uh, the, the delivery date, and they don't even know exactly what the car looks like. So there's a great latent demand for these vehicles that I think will drive rapid demand uh, and rapid sales in the next few years. And the reason that this is occurring is fundamentally that electric vehicles are basically a better car. Um, and you can see this in US sales already. So uh, the Tesla Model S is already the best selling luxury car model in America. Um, it was in 2015. Um, and this is all because, again, it is a better car. It's a better car because of the practical things, that it's a smoother ride, uh, that the acceleration on these cars is much more aggressive because of the, the speed at which power can be delivered to the engines and because you don't need to run through gears um, in that early phase of acceleration. Uh, but they're better cars for other reasons as well. Um, energy efficiency, combustion engine is very inefficient. Um, only 20% of its energy actually get, ends up uh, in propelling the vehicle. Um, also, electric vehicles are significantly, significant, uh, significantly uh, cheaper to run. In fact, there's a strong argument to, to make that electric vehicles, uh, the cost of actually operating these vehicles will fall to, to close to zero. And that's because the maintenance is far, far less. So that, uh, that picture on your screen shows the component bits uh, that go into a combustion engine car. 
compared with a, a um, electric vehicle where there may only be 100 moving parts. In fact, there's been some discussion that Tesla may move towards oper uh, offering free lifetime maintenance on their cars. They're so confident that little will go wrong and if it does, it's cheaper to fix. And the other thing is the cost of running these cars, which is already you know, very, very low, only $300 per year, that will also fall as well. Because what will occur is companies like Westfield are already offering free recharging in their shopping centres. Um, and that's because someone who's recharging their car is a guaranteed customer for that hour or so it takes for them to do that. Uh, so yeah, they are, for, for a lot of reasons, a better car. The question is what happens when they will very soon be a cheaper car. And uh, that sort of equation on them becoming a cheaper car is all about batteries. It's all about battery cost. Now, here's another one of these exponential curves. This one is showing uh, the cost of batteries. Um, and you see there that as uh, uh, as scale increases in the industry, basically as more electric vehicles are produced, the cost of batteries is very, very rapidly falling. Uh, and this is important because the cost of the battery is a very large part of the cost of these electric vehicles at the moment. So at the moment, the, that battery cost is about $35,000 per car. Uh, but over the next five years, that's forecast to fall to $8,000 per car. And once it does that, you will see that uh, you will rapidly go to a point where electric vehicles are currently more expensive than combustion engine vehicles through cost equivalents, probably in about 2020. And then after that, electric vehicles will actually be cheaper, uh, not just to run, but also to buy than a combustion engine car. Uh, so that's the prediction. And then, after that is then you start asking the questions, well, if these cars are cheaper to own and cheaper to run, why would you buy a, a conventional car? Uh, and hence that's when you start to think about, well, uh, yeah, at what point do effectively uh, we stop producing combustion engine vehicles? And of course, then the, the fewer of them that get made, the more costly they become as scale begins to work against them. Now, one of the, one of the main reasons we're confident that battery costs will fall and drive this innovation is Tesla. Uh, Tesla's great gift to the world, if you like, is the recognition that the main driver of battery costs is actually scale. So Elon Musk's great insight was then, well, if I can double the world's battery production, I can probably halve the cost of batteries. So he embarked on this project called the Tesla Gigafactory, which is just an enormous, enormous uh, scale production in the Nevada desert. And that's exactly what this does. It's going to double world battery production in one single project. Um, and effectively at least halve the cost of batteries and could even do more. But importantly, now that he's done that, other companies and countries have seen the opportunity. So you're see seeing similar type projects now underway in Korea in particular, uh, but also in Japan and China. Now, uh, I mentioned at the start that there were sort of complementary uh, technology change that are driving this clean tech revolution. Part of it is cars. I've moved on to batteries. But now I want to focus on the other uh, important innovation that comes off the back of cheaper batteries. And that is home electrical storage. So if you've got these batteries for your car, then they can also be used for other means. And that is going to be home battery storage and then industrial uh, uh, battery storage uh, for electrical grids and other uh, industrial purposes. And again, this is going to be uh, another change of, I think, of monumental uh, proportions in the way we live our lives. And the reason that batteries are important for solar is that there is one big practical problem with solar 
electricity, which is that it produces most of the energy it needs during the middle of the day, uh, but most people's major energy demand is at the start of the day and the end of the day. And hence, a battery solution that can really only, which only needs to hold power for 24 hours can dramatically change the economics and the viability of solar. So this is exactly the, uh, the area that we are entering sort of what, right now. Um, so what, you are, what we think that you will see is a very rapid take up of both home and industrial uh, sort of battery storage. Now remember there is, uh, there, is bat uh, sorry, there is energy storage at the moment. Uh, really a hydro scheme is a massive battery and a massively inefficient battery because all a hydro scheme does is it pumps up water up a hill when there's excess energy and then lets it run down that hill in the middle of the, uh, when that uh, energy is needed. Uh, so batteries are just simply a cheaper, much more effective way to do exactly the same thing. And now our expectations is that this sort of take up of home solar will occur very rapidly, simply because it is actually already cheaper uh, to operate a home solar plus battery um, system than it is to get energy from the grid. And that's what that, sort of, that first chart is meant to show. Uh, if you just perhaps focus in on the early parts of that chart, uh, the grid cost of, uh, of getting energy is you know, 25 to 30 uh, cents per kilowatt hour, depending on which state you're, you're, you're in. But solar plus battery is already cheaper than that. Um, and of course, we, sit, we show those lines diverging uh, because as more people leave the grid, the cost of the grid goes up uh, because you uh, end up having to spread the cost of the grid over fewer numbers of, uh, of customers. And of course, the solar plus battery cost goes down, uh, presuming there's ongoing benefits to uh, ongoing cost reductions in solar plus battery cost. Um, so that's already a pretty sort of phenomenal um, uh, finding and you've already seen in the chart next to that that the take up of solar, if you focus on the first four or five bars, has already been very aggressive and again it's one, another one of these exponential charts. Uh, so we would expect that to continue. Um, now an important part of this is that uh, uh, Australia is actually a very expensive place to buy power and that's because we're a big country so the cost of distribution um, is actually sort of very high so that contributes to that. Now the one thing that's holding this back at the moment is that the cost of those home installation of solar plus battery is still quite expensive uh, of the order of $30,000. Um, now over the payback uh, you know, you will get that money back in the, the, the cost of electricity that you save, but it's still quite a significant upfront cost for now. Uh, but of course those costs are going to fall very, very rapidly and it's likely that government incentives will return uh, to, to make, that, um, uh, make that gap uh, even lower. Uh, so again, uh, so moving on to what this means globally, i show you another exponential curve. And this is globally installed solar uh, photovoltaic uh, installations. So you can see that there has been very, very rapid take up of solar globally um, over the last sort of 10 years or so. This chart is growing at 40% per year. Um, and another fascinating thought experiment is what happens if it continues to grow at 40% per year uh, for another 15 years. And if you get to that number, you get solar being able basically to contribute all of the world's energy needs. Uh, so I think that is quite remarkable and again, it's right on our doorstep. And this is not no longer being driven, I think, by government policy. This is actually simply the cost of solar has been falling very, very rapidly. 
Um, it's falling, it's basically, it's, it's uh, falling by a factor of four every sort of two years. Um, and, uh, and so it's got a life of its own now. Uh, so uh, if you combine all these things together, um, and I, again, I've been talking about a sort of a 15 year sort of time frame, uh, but um, you know, that's a very, very different world by the year 2030. It could be one where basically the next vehicle you buy will be electric and you may never buy a con combustion engine vehicle before. It will be a world where uh, at least half of us, you know, unless we live in apartments, will be getting most of our power from the sun uh, and storing it ourselves. Uh, and this has a range of very interesting implications at both the market level uh, as well, as well as the way we live our lives. So I thought I would sort of finish here by sort of going through uh, some of those uh, market implications. Uh, so number one, uh, and perhaps the, the, the largest, is what it means for oil. Uh, so 60% of oil is used for land transportation purposes, uh, obviously particularly cars. Now that is significantly, significantly uh, at threat. Um, so I think that's the, really, you know, the, the, the number one uh, sort of question mark, I, I really I would have, what, what does this mean for the oil price on a five-year view? Um, secondly, uh, coal is very, very similar. Now you can make the argument for the electrical grid that you still need a grid, you still need um, transmission uh, because most households will probably decide that they will meet only a proportion of their own needs uh, through solar plus battery and at times they will want to sort of sell back to the grid at other times they'll need to buy from it. So you still need a transmission of power. What you certainly will not will need a lot less of is generation. Uh, so coal uh, is most vulnerable to that. Um, and in fact the state governments that have recently sold the generation assets are going to look very, very smart I think over the next few years um, as this comes through. Uh, the th third point perhaps is what it means, well what in particular what uh, electric vehicles may mean uh, for the broader auto industry. Uh, a much simpler car where fewer things go wrong has big implication for mechanics. It also has big implications for uh, car dealerships. So remember that uh, car dealerships actually most make most of their money uh, not out of selling the car but um, out of that servicing. And if that servicing is far less, and in particular if Tesla that is currently leading the industry says we're going to give away free maintenance, then the car dealership model um, is significantly uh, at threat, I think. Um, some of the other uh, implications, if you're trying to think of some of the, the, the winners, and mind you, it, it's, it's, very, it's one of these things that it's very easy to identify the losers from this, uh, and we, which I've mentioned, you know, coal, oil, perhaps the electrical grid. It's much harder to identify the winners because it's, uh, you know, it's an industry I think that's kind of up for grabs um, and exactly who will become the new Ford, GM and Chrysler um, of the electric vehicle market um, is still unclear. It's very unlikely to be Ford and GM and Chrysler just from their starting point of probably uh, being desperate to defend uh, their existing market share, I think they will struggle. But you're also seeing the emergence of a, a number of uh, Asian companies, uh, particularly Chinese companies, that are seeing this as, uh, as a significant change. So the big emerging names in the auto industry are likely to be Samsung, uh, LG, um, and the Chinese company Foxconn. 
So Foxconn is the company that makes all of Apple's products. Uh, you know, it actually sort of manufactures all of them, um, and they are massively increasing uh, their capacity to, to build electric vehicles. Fundamentally, you are seeing tech companies that will move into the car space because they are seeing these electric vehicles as computers on wheels. Um, anyway, to, to move then back into some, some of the companies that I think will be winners, uh, particularly in the Australian context, uh, there's uh, you know, maybe sort of four groups that I can mention. Number one will be lithium producers. Um, so at the moment, the battery technology that's been championed by Tesla and LG in particular is, is a lithium graphite battery, where lithium is on uh, is the anode and, and graphite is a cathode, or, or the other way around, I forgot that. Um, but anyway, so, so lithium uh, is, is a major, major winner. Uh, there's a few uh, listed lithium companies in the Australian markets. Um, so, you know, perhaps you can ask your financial advisor to identify those for you. There's also a significant number of graphite companies in the Australian market. And what you're after there is very high quality graphite um, because that enables more energy or increase in energy density. Uh, the other winners are companies that are supplying the, um, the some of the technology behind the solar power. Um, and um, there's one Australian company that is providing smart meters to the rest of the world. Um, and then there's also other battery producers, and there's one in particular, one battery producer in the Australian market uh, that is also providing those home storage batteries um, in competition uh, with, uh, with Tesla. Um, anyway, so, so that is basically the heart of my uh, presentation. I'm, I'm happy to take uh, questions now. Uh, but just to say, you know, look, this is um, this is sort of, I guess, sort of a focus on one of the parts of technology that I think is going to be sort of very significant over the next next uh, few years. But perhaps in future webinars, we can talk about um, some of the other um, issues that are that are that are just as interesting. So with that, I think we're going to hand over to questions, Rob. Yep, I'm going to say um, thanks a lot for that, Tim. That's uh been you know, a really great presentation and uh, I've certainly learned a few bits and pieces and now I need to go back and look at my own share portfolio uh, to see where I've, I've got my investments. As I said, we're now going to um, look at the questions. Um, as we read through them, um, if you haven't put a question in already, please um, type them in now and we will uh, go through and, uh, and attempt to answer them. So just while we're checking the questions and, uh, and you're typing them in, um, let me take this opportunity to remind you of the upcoming webinars from the Davidson Institute. So tomorrow we're doing Investing in Property, Measuring Returns, and next week, A Beginner's Guide to Self-Managed Super Funds. So I see there's been one um, question come through. Uh, yeah, but, uh, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll briefly summarise it. So it's a question from, uh, from, from Sean Chris. Um, talking about uh, Tesla and, and commenting that um, uh, that Facebook and, and others have been questioned about the impact they'll have on the world, but surely Tesla to will have have a big impact and could become the world's most valuable company. Uh, that's that's interesting. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with the sentiment that, that this is going to be large. But what we really don't know is whether Tesla will be end up being the, the titan here. And the reason I say that is um, I think Tesla will end up changing the world but may not be the biggest beneficiary. Uh, because fundamentally the, the technology behind that electric vehicle is actually not that complex. Uh, the engines uh, on these electric vehicles are in fact not much more complicated than than a fan engine, you know, a um, a cooling fan engine. So um, so Tesla may well spark off this revolution, but other other companies um, in Japan, in Korea, in China may actually end up stealing their lunch. So like I might be wrong on that, but.
but but that is my hunch that that um, people will see how successful Tesla has been, and in particular will see how successful that new product launch in April will be, and there will be a great rush uh, to, um, to 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 get a stake in the, in this. Um, um, in this industry, and, and again, it may not be so Tesla that ends up getting the lion's share of the market. Uh, the second question, uh, I've got someone asking actually for, 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 for the companies, and um, seeing we're not a financial advisor and we, we, we can only give general advice, uh, I think the decision has been that, that we won't actually comment on particular companies, I'm afraid. But I, I think any sensible broker would, would be able to give you that information. Okay, well, thanks, Tim. That seems to be all of the questions that we've had today. So uh, that, that's great. Um, so what we're going to do now is basically say thank you all for coming along. Um, I'm going to say on this page, please note that there is a disclaimer. And as Tim said, today's presentation was of a general nature and does not constitute advice on your personal situation. I say a very big thank you for Tim today. Um, great information and uh, thanks for giving us your time um, to help us out there. Yeah, my, my pleasure, Rob, and thanks all for listening. Yeah. And I'm going to say thank you to everyone online today for joining us. A copy of today's live webinar will be available, so we have been recording this. We'll put it up on the West Coast Davis Institute. I'm going to say hopefully by the end of the week, no uh, technical issues uh, happening there. So thank you all again for attending, and good day.